Hey, what is going on, everybody? And welcome to Listen Money Matters. Cash rules everything around me, so it's a good thing that I rule cash. My name is Thomas, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Andrew. Andrew, how are you, and what are you drinking this morning, dude? Um, I'm good. I'm just drinking a coffee because I have a long drive later, but I still have a bunch of my straws left over, and my wife conveniently flipped it upside down so you don't see the balls. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Just. I didn't. I, okay, I did not know that you were going to do that, but for some reason, I just had this sneaking suspicion that you were going to be drinking out of a dick straw. And because it is flipped upside down, like you realize what you're doing right now. Oh my god! <laughs> the show moving, is over. Moving on. Moving on. That's actually what oh, I won't say it, but that thing that you're thinking is what my wife said to me when she gave me my coffee. Welcome to this mm. show. I'm just drinking some spicy tea because I like spicy tea out of a regular, plain, normal mug, actually. Not even a Sailor Moon this week. That's just very a Starbucks responsible mug. of you, Thomas. It is very responsible of me. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Where are you <laughs> driving to anyway? Uh, we're going to uh, New Pulse, New York. Um, it is Laura and I's anniversary this weekend, so we're escaping oh. New York to go do uh, marriage things. Congratulations. How many years is it now? Four? Um, <laughs> wow, you're a real nice guy challenging me on the radio for the. I think it's four, yeah. Okay. I know uh, her I, for like... Um, that's like the good friend test. Mm. I thought I should know how many years you've been married because I've, I've known you for almost three, no, two years, three years. Yeah, I've yeah. known you for three. You guys have been married one year when I met you. So mm. yeah, I can do math. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, so today for all the new people listening to our podcast, we are getting right back to basics and we are going just hardcore on spending, saving, all the things you need to know to basically, in Andrew's words, become an adult with your money. And uh, for the second time in the show's history, we have Farnoosh Tarabi on the show. Now, Farnoosh is the host of the So Money podcast, which is really popular. A lot of people listen to it. She's also wrote, written, is that the right word? Uh, three books, right, Farnoosh? Correct. You wrote Your So Money. My life. Uh, you are live, yes. I have a hot mic. Okay, yes, it is three books. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So you wrote your so money back in 2008, correct? Yeah, we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary. Oh, wow. Crazy. Yeah, we are. Crazy. Don't tell me that. That's like one year before <laughs> I graduated high school. So that means my 10 year high school reunion is coming up. And I need to find a reason to skip it. <laughs> oh, my God. You're, you're such a baby. I was going to say. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Am now I? I feel, now I feel like crap. I feel old. Hey, I have the most facial hair here. But you know what? We're all living to be 120. I just uh, had the chance to meet Deepak Chopra the other day. I know. Really? I'm so fabulous. And he scared the shit out of all of us. Can I say that on your podcast? We Damn started right. the episode with the dick straws. So. Yeah. So it's all, it's all, it's all downhill. Um, basically, he's I mean, it's not his data, but there's a lot of science out there that says we're all if you're se if you're under the age of 70, by, or 75 rather by 2030. So if you're alive in 2030 and you're under the age of 75, you may very well live to be 120. Wow. So nice. you uh, will have a lot to be advising in the financial <laughs> realm. <laughs> yeah. Your podcast will still be an unnecessary thing. We will still be talking these, about this. I have these big stressful conversations with my uh, best friend about like, the macroeconomic implica implications of stuff like that. But I agree, and I fully intend to live to 120 or longer because 100 is just not long enough these days. Mm -hmm. So, Farnish, I know you, you can talk about, like, any topic because you've been helping people manage their money for a really long time. But recently you wrote an article about splurges that are actually smart to make. So I actually want to start off with that because I'm curious what you would consider to be a smart splurge. Sure. Yes. Well, yes, it was for Oprah magazine. I'm a monthly columnist there. I read about money for the Oprah readers and they wanted me to talk about expenses that are worth it. In other words, there is some measurable return on investment. It could be literal dollars and cents that you'll pocket because you made this smart investment and you'll make the money back in savings, or it's just good because it will mean more health for you or, um, you know, more sleep <laughs> as a mattress, for example, is a really great investment. Um, I know you can go mm. buy one at Ikea and, you know, honestly, I think 
maybe in your 20s, you're buying your first apartment or you're renting your first apartment, you don't want to make a lot of big investments. So maybe get the Ikea furniture, but get a good mattress. And what is a good mattress? So, you know, price does sometimes dictate quality, not always, but Mm -hmm. in the world of mattresses, you know, I talked to, there are mattress experts out there. Did you know this? No, I do know this (laughs) because we, we've had mattress sponsors in the podcast before. So I spent hours like combing through mattress reviews to make sure they're good. Um, so I talked (laughs) to this guy, Sean Fry, he's the founder of sleeping like a log.com. Okay. And he recommends going with a mattress that is 100% certified organic because Hmm. regular mattresses may be treated with things like flame retardants. Um, and, uh, that's been linked to disrupt thyroid function, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. It's, it's kind of messed up. Interesting. Like it's really messed up and organic mattresses are also biodegradable. So for that, you're going to end up have to spend probably three grand for a king size. So if you're going to go, if you're going to splurge, splurge well. Mm -hmm. Um, I also found some really interesting data behind like how sleep correlates to mortality. And, uh, we, we found that, um, your mortality risk jumps by 13% if you get less than six hours of sleep per night. Mm-hmm. Wow. And this is actually a pillar of well being that uh, a lot of the, you know, um, like people like Deepak Chopra and, and, and everyone um, like him advocates. Um, Ariana Huffington, she's big on sleep. You know, that getting sleep is not just um, a nice to have, it's a need to have. Yeah, and exactly. And then I broke it down. I was like, if you're going to spend, let's say, let's say not 3000, but let's say 1500 is also a pretty, you know, you're going to get a nice mattress for $1,500. That's 59 cents per day. If you actually keep it for about seven years, which is what the recommended recommended time period is for a mattress about seven years before you replace it. Oh, okay. So speaking of sleep, another thing that I spent money, uh, one thing that I spent a lot of money on this year, my, probably my biggest expense all year, which was a, a big decision, but we did it was a night nurse for our newborn. So maybe your audience aren't parents yet. If you are, you know what I'm talking about. So you have a baby and you don't get sleep because babies don't sleep through the night right away. And then there's this period of time, usually like between six weeks and 10 weeks when they, some babies get a lot of gas or reflux. So the sleep becomes even more challenging for them. And as a result also for the parents. So I went back to work pretty quickly after having my kid by my own, you know, will, I didn't have to, fortunately, it wasn't like an employer was like, you must come back. I wanted to come back to work, but you know, slowly I was working from home, but I needed to be functional. I needed to be able to make like clear headed decisions and going on, you know, four hours of broken up sleep per night just wasn't going to cut it. Mm -hmm. Plus when you don't sleep well, you eat shit. You know, you like are just eating whatever you're always hungry. Your metabolism's like screwed up. I was not able to really focus on my health either during the daytime hours. So I think it was like a a Friday night I was up with my baby and she's a, she's a healthy big baby. And it was like physically, I couldn't like walk anymore with her for like, you know, and she didn't want to be held Mm. put down. She wanted to be held constantly walking. So finally I was like, it's New York city. I'm going to see if there is a human being out there that's qualified to come and live with us for at least every night Mm -hmm. for a while so that I can get some sleep and my husband can get some sleep. And sure enough, this, there's a whole world of baby nurses out there or night nurses that they're trained to basically, um, be with your child through the night and train them to go back to sleep. And they, this woman was an, a, like a miracle worker. She came in and she analyzed everything we were doing. She's like, you need some, a white noise machine. You need like a sleep sack. You need overnight diapers. You need this, that. And so we had to get all this stuff that we didn't realize, which I was like, Oh, this is like another expense, but it was totally worth it. Our baby is now sleeping through the night. And when I tell people how I felt the first few nights of getting a full night's sleep after not having anything like that for like six weeks, I felt like I was at the beach. I felt (laughs) like I was on vacation, but I was working. I had responsibilities. I also have a three-year-old. So like, it wasn't like I was just lounging, but my daytime, I, I felt like the clouds parted. There was no more fogginess. It was incredible. You know, everything they tell you, it's true. 
sleep is important. So whatever you can do to enhance your ability to get sleep, whether it's hiring help so that you can sleep at night or getting a good mattress or I bought a noise machine. Noise machines are incredible, like $25 on Amazon. Mm -hmm. It's great. Like I think if you can invest in that part of your life, it will mean a longer and healthier life. Mm -hmm. So why not? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel the same way about like buying quality food because if your if your inputs are correct, then your outputs are going to be better than they would be if they aren't. So mm-hmm. you will most likely make more money. You'll be happier while you're doing it. It just makes sense. I always uh, thought it was it's, crazy. People put premium in their cars and like shit in their bodies. Uh, when your car will probably true. work on like regular, you know. But right. Or Ariana Huffington yeah. says like we're more we're more quick to find a way to charge our phones. Like I've literally raced across town to an Apple store to charge my phone, but I'll go on to like four hours of sleep and I don't care about my own booting my own self, you know, or like charging my own body. And, um, yeah, we're more attached to objects than I've always been really interested in that lack of loss aversion that we seem to have with time and with our health that we have with everything else, like our phone batteries or our money. Like people, I know so many people who won't spend a little bit of money to gain back their time. They just like, they don't realize that time and money are both resources with value. There's like, oh, my time's worthless and I can never lose a dollar. So they, I don't know, like they just, they'll go to, you know, they'll spend way too much time trying to get cheaper gas or something like that. Mm. And they realize they're losing their time. So I'm curious, does this person actually live with you or do they just yes. show up at a certain time at night and kind of just stay there for the night? So generally people who work uh, as night nurses, they come for either 10 or 12 hour stretches overnight and they do stay at your home. Okay. Um, so she would come at seven and leave at seven o'clock in the morning. And she so would she's get- not there all day though. No, you can get someone, but I feel like that's not fair to that person. You know, they need, they need a break, you know, they need to go home and and rest. And I was very insistent that when she was here, she would sleep when the baby was sleeping. Cause I didn't want her, I I knew what it was like, you know, if you're not sleeping and you have to like take care of a kid, it's not safe. (laughs) How much does a person like this cost a night? All right. We're just between friends, right? Yeah. Uh, No one's uh, listening. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It's $300 a night. Wow. It's like a hotel. It's, like it's like going to a luxury hotel. Okay. <laughs> it's a privilege. It's an absolute luxury, but I was making money. I, yeah. I was able to make money. I was able to not make stupid mistakes. I was able to cross the street and not get hit by a car, you yeah. know? Um, it's also worth saying that this, these are probably the New York prices where if true. you were, I don't know, somewhere else, it may be cheaper. Right. And guess what? I don't have, I don't, I work for myself, so I don't have a company paying me to not work. I was, yeah. I don't work, I don't make money. So for me, it's like it was an investment and yeah, it it's awesome. I mean, if you have the way, if you have a way to invest in something like this, I 100% support it. So when you spend Absolutely. on something like this mentally, does this come out of like your expense bucket or does this come out of your savings bucket? Uh, well, I guess it comes out of expenses. You know, I don't really, it's not coming out of like my retirement account or my, um, it's not coming out of like my money market account or my brokerage account. Uh, it's coming out of my expenses. You know, I'm not so compartmentalized when it comes to my money. I definitely have buckets for long-term savings. So I have two different 529 accounts for my kids. I have a brokerage account. I have a five, uh, what's it called? A, um, SEP IRA. Mm-hmm. which you get if you're an entrepreneur, it's like a, an IRA, but you can contribute like over 50 grand to it a year if you want. And it's tax deductible. I have a Roth IRA so that, you know, I don't touch, I don't take out. And I just, that I see, and it's, I like seeing that grow. And then I have basically my business account and my personal account. And that came out of my personal account is the personal mm-hmm. expense. And then, yeah. um, a lot of my expenses come out of, um, I have an American express card for personal and then one for business. And that's how I, that's how I do it. And then they, the personal expenses from pay for the personal credit card, the personal yeah. checking account pays for the personal credit card, the business checking account pays for the business credit card. So that's it. I mean, as far as like saving for a rainy day, 
I know that I'm living below my means and I don't need to like, I've just been doing this enough. It's almost like a diet, you know? Well, when yeah. like you say once, you know you're, you're living below your means, like what does that mean? Like you, like Because you I always have a surplus. Earn 2,000, spend 1,000? Like no, what's I don't. The, you know. you know, I don't keep a tally in my head. I just, I look at my numbers every single day mm-hmm. and I see, and I know, and I know what my major expenses are. I know approximately how much our average monthly spend is on all of our yeah. necessities. It's, it's repetitive. So you just look and you see. And so when I get that credit card bill, which is basically my expense, my expenses every month. And if, um, mm-hmm. Because you do you know, almost all expenses on the credit card, right? Pretty much, yeah. A few Get things come points. out of my checking account, but mostly it's credit. Mm-hmm. And so I can see, I'm like, oh, okay. I know like on average, my monthly expenses tend to be like 15 grand a month, all in like mortgage, food, like car expenses, all that. Yeah. Um, so if I'm suddenly like 20 grand one month, then the next month I know I got to keep it to like so, more like 10 or 12. How do you, so, uh, it's like, you, I'm sure you can see at the end of the month on the statement that the number is X, but when you said like, you know what the reoccurring pieces are and perhaps like what is going where, what do you do to, to like get insights into that? Do you like literally go I line by line? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of mint. Uh, I know that's uh, something that a lot of us use and it's been around for, it's like the long, it's like one of the oldest um, FinTech tools out there. And I, mm-hmm. I blog for mint. And mm-hmm. so I, I always check my mint account and I like to see how much I'm earning. I use Quicken. I use QuickBooks actually for my business. So I can see like, I want to just make sure that how much I ever, how much I made is substantially more than how much I spent. Yeah. And you can see that right away. You, I get my, you know, profit statements every month Mm -hmm. and you know, that's what I do. I just have a, a, an ongoing awareness of what I'm spending and what I'm not spending and what I'm making. Yeah. So you treat your business, you know, you want to profit, blah, blah, blah. Do you treat your personal account similarly? Sometimes. Yeah. So if I had a good month and like, you know, this has been, I've been right now promoting a workshop in the fall and I've been getting a lot of people signing up and that's been a really nice revenue stream for me that, you know, I need to obviously save a lot of that for the execution of the workshop, but I bought a nice purse yesterday. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) That I really wanted. And I have (laughs) thresholds for things that I spend on. Like I won't Mm -hmm. actually go out and buy more than like, I mean, this may, this is me. So I'm, I'm probably going to get some hate mail, but you know what? Screw all the haters. Like everyone's got their thing, right? I yeah, ask it on my yeah. show every day. Like what's your splurge or what's your, you know, your non-negotiable thing that you buy that, you know, it's a little bit more than what others would spend, but it's you and you can afford it. So I will never go out and buy like a $5,000 handbag. No, mm-hmm. even though I could probably afford it. I have wanted to buy a Cartier watch for like the past 10 years. I just can't bring myself to do it. Cause I want like the nice gold one and I don't want to just yeah. get like the, you know, the, the silver one, which is not my favorite, but it's a lot more affordable. So I just don't get, I just like, I buy like a swatch watch and that's what I wear or like an <laughs> iPhone, an iWatch, but I will spend like two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 on artwork mm. because I feel like I look at it every day. It's meaningful. I, I, I love my house. I, it's, I feel like it's, everyone can enjoy it and appreciate it and we'll have it for a lot. So it's just me that's, and I don't want to buy it cause I'm going to sell it in 10 years. That's not how I think when I buy art, right. yeah. but I, but I, and then like for vacations, um, we don't go all the time and we are now a family of four. So when we do go on vacations, we need certain accommodations and mm-hmm. I don't want to be stressed. I don't want to be like, it's a vacation. Overwhelmed. It's a vacation. Yeah. And I have been overwhelmed and stressed on vacation, taking care of like an 18 month old. Um, we did an Airbnb in the Hamptons and I arrived and it was like a death trap. I like, I didn't remember that I had to baby proof this house. There was literally oh, a cigar yeah. cutter, a cigar cutter sitting on the <laughs> coffee table. You mean a finger cutter? <laughs> yeah. So I like literally had to put everything on shelves and, um, and you just like by eight o'clock, I was exhausted mm-hmm. and I didn't even have time to like read a book on the beach. It was, it was a, you know, oh, boohoo, Farnoosh, you know, going to the Hamptons, can't read a book. But it's like, this is, this was, this was supposed to be my time yeah, <laughs> to enjoy yeah. myself. And I wasn't. So I've learned the right way and I've learned that it costs more. 
if you want to have like a you know a stress free vacation. So I don't I don't know if you watch much TV. Have you seen the Daredevil series? No. 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 So don't really have to see it, but I, I watched that a couple of years ago, I think, and it finally put into perspective why people spend so much money on art and like why it makes sense. I always I never understood it before, but they put it in such a good way. They were like, art is worth money if it's painful for you to not have it. Hmm. And like that, that's like the only explanation that's ever made sense to me because it's like, OK, I can understand like something speaks to you or you just love it. And OK, that, then it's worth whatever you're willing to pay for it. So that's why I guess people are willing to pay for like three toilets in a row or something and call it fine art because I, I guess they find that whatever moves you yeah their, their lives and the other thing I wanted to mention is as I have grown in um the earnings that I make I found that like you always look at the people above you and you're like well that thing that they're spending money on money on is stupid but whatever level you're at whether it's me five years ago making $200 a month as a college student or me now making what I make now, like there's always a logical reason it seems for what you spend money on. You always like do a calculation in your head. Either my value is aligned with this purchase I'm making or I'm actually doing this for a business reason. I will gain more productivity or more time out of spending this money. So I think like something integral for anybody to learn, even if they're just starting out in their personal finance journey is don't, Beat yourself up about your purchases if you have a good justification for making them just because people who are above or below your financial station are going to like scoff at them. Mm. Yeah. Like there's I would no even go so f- I would even go so far to say that sometimes a little luxury must fall into your life and you don't need to feel like you have to feel like, you know, so justified about it. And if you, I don't, I'm not saying like retail therapy is good and you should do this as a practice, but sometimes if you can, if you can call yourself out and say, I'm buying this because I feel like crap Mm -hmm. (laughs) and this, I, I need something to make me feel better. And I understand that this is not how I should be going about making all my purchasing decisions, but right now this really feels good and I can, and I can afford it. That's gotta be the part of the the equation. It's not like you're putting this on a credit card and paying it over six months, but maybe having a little bit of a reserve in your, you know, savings account or checking account. That's like my bad day (laughs) splurge, you know, and some people have a bad year or a bad month. You know, I went through some challenges in 20, was it like 2015? Was it 2015? Yeah. Um, yeah, like I had to go, it was like I had a medical scare and, you know, I got through it, but I was like, damn, I could really use a Louis Vuitton bag right now. And (laughs) 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 Oh gosh. And, but you know, I, I, so I bought one and I love it. And I, I, and I look at it and it reminds me of that hard time that I went through Mm -hmm. and that I got through it and it's symbolic to me, you know, like it was something that I bought in a moment in time that I knew would make me feel better in the moment. And it still is, is like something that I'm, I'm really excited to wear and I like, and it, it's personal. I don't do this every month, but it was, mm-hmm. you know, just something that I went through and I wanted to reward myself in, in a superficial way. And I did. So if we were to rewind back to, and and I think it's worth saying that you've been doing this a while and have had quite a lot of success doing it. So the Louis Vuitton bag for you is not what the Louis Vuitton bag was to the scrappy Farnoosh on month three. But if you were to think back to the scrappy Farnoosh on month three, what would have been a splurge for you then that would have given you like the same feeling, but you know... Obviously, you couldn't afford the Louis Vuitton bag when yeah. you were not anybody. I think it was, it would have been a night out with friends, really, you know, not having to get just the side salad and, um, you know, uh, one glass of wine. I could get maybe um, a cocktail and, uh, you know, a steak, <laughs> like, and just, and, and not feel like I had to be, and I could split the bill and not be worried about, like, just paying my fair share, or it would have been, um, you know, a bunch of, maybe it was like a little weekend trip, you know, like a road trip with some girlfriends to Boston. We would do that or Philly for the weekend. We'd get like, um, 
you know, a, a B and B or we'd split a hotel room, you know, that sort of thing experiences. And I don't want to come off as like this materialistic person. And I actually will say that you're not going to have any long-term happiness from buying material things Mm -hmm. relative to experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, But if your material purchases can represent experiences, right? So like you go to France on your honeymoon and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's your experience and you come back with like a really pretty piece of art or a scarf or something and you cherish it and you wear it in memory of that experience. I think that can't be a bad thing. I think that kind of goes hand in hand with it. Um, but for the Oprah piece that I did, you know, we all know that experiences, I think by now there's a lot of data out there and we've been reporting on it that, you know, whether it's like a yoga retreat or like, I went to Hamilton the other week as our combination anniversary Valentine's Day push present <laughs> for me and my husband. It's like we're done with gifts this year. No Christmas. <laughs> it was well worth it. Mm-hmm. But we know that, you know, that's something that your money is you will see it. You will feel an ROI on that because it's a memory. You can reflect on it. It's like a gift that keeps on giving. Mm-hmm. But there was a recent study out of the San Francisco State University that found that um to get the most bang for your buck, you want to book that experience far in advance. So like we just booked a trip oh. that's going to be happening in January. And so, so then you anticipate up, it, right? So anticipate it. I'm like reading reviews. I'm like, you know, looking forward to just, I don't even know what, you know, like I, I'm like imagining what it's going to be like. I'm talking to friends who've been to this country and trying to imagine what I would feel like and do when I get there. And it's exciting. And there's like this buildup. Mm-hmm. And so there is joy in planning and anticipation. So yeah. that's key. So like buying a last minute ticket to a concert, that's cool. But if you plan it and you buy it like six months in advance or two months in advance, like my girlfriends and I just went to go see New Kids on the Block. <laughs> <laughs> in, in Brooklyn, it was the the opening act was Boys to Men and Paula Abdul. I mean, how can you not oh, that's go? Pretty awesome. <laughs> and we got the tickets. They weren't that expensive. We got the tickets about two months ago, and the whole time we're like texting each other, like oh oh oh, like and every time we'd like sign off on an email, it was like you got the right stuff, Terry. You know, and we would just send, <laughs> send these like gifts of like you know Donnie Wahlberg, and it was, you know we we just had a good laugh about it for two months. And then once we got there, it was even more exciting because it was like, oh, my God, this is actually happening. Yeah. So, yeah. That reminds me when I was a kid and like we would have a, a plan to go to Disneyland and it's yeah. in four or five months. Oh, and my God. It's just like this anticipation just, <laughs> or like, you know, we I know what I'm doing for my birthday party, but it's in two months. It's just like I'm so excited to do it. So I absolutely agree. And I, I haven't thought about it in that way before, but you're totally right. Like doing something that far in advance you kind of like extend the enjoyment from now until then. And you have the time to make the money to pay for it or, pay, mm-hmm. you know, re- come break even, <laughs> you know, like make the money to feel feel like you've at least financially justified it as well. So I want to yeah. ask, how do you prioritize the, the wants versus like the, the health of your finances? Because I guess there you would have had to I save – yeah. X time ago to be able to go to that concert. Like, how do you, I don't know. How do you plan it? Hmm. I guess, again, I I think I, in my head have this sort of running, I have running figures in my head. Like I would never pay more than a hundred dollars for a concert ticket. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't pay more than X for this X for that. Mm -hmm. And it's, and I try to spread it out. Right. So we don't take vacations more than like once or twice a year. We don't overdo things. So, but when we do things, we do them, we do what we want right? and we yeah. do it right. And we still try to save. I mean, I even booking this trip, we're going in six months to a, uh, my husband, my whole family, it's our first like big family trip as a family of four getting on an airplane, going to uh, the Caribbean. I, researched it and I were going during the first week of January as opposed to the last week of December because it's like a fraction of the price. So and because I work for myself and my husband has a flexible schedule, we can afford to go when no one else is going on vacation. Yeah. And that's how we are getting what we want, but saving a lot of money in the process. Mm-hmm. And I booked it through JetBlue, which gave us a package deal, flight and hotel. 
So, you know, I, I think we save probably 50% this way, changing the dates, but like we're getting what we want. So I still, the, 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 the 23 year old Farnoosh is still in me, like still looking to save, find a way. Like even when I got the designer bag, I got a discount because, um, I was able to like, I, you can get it through a department store sometimes. And my mother knows a sales lady at this particular department store in California who can get her a discount on anything. Mm -hmm. So I use that, I use that connection and I say 15%, like you can't get 15% off luxury handbags unless you buy them secondhand. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm still a hustler at, at heart and a bargain dealer at heart. And you can't get a second handbag. <laughs> it's also all relative because like a hundred dollars feels however feels when you're in a thousand and about a thousand feels the same when you earn 10,000 and not that you just go and blow a thousand dollars, but, um, you feel differently about like, um, the time it may save you or the benefits you may get, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to save an extra 10. Or something. Right. I remember when I was an employee, like a 14 year old grocery bagger at the grocery store, I would put every expense in terms of like how many hours of work that cost me. Right. So I was like, yes. oh, this pizza from Pizza Hut was like 1.4 hours of my well, time. Well, I'll tell you, I back to the baby nurse, I justified it even more because I was doing this video project that was paying me $900 per visit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and that would take like three hours mm, max. Awesome. And I was like, so like yeah. that, if I do just like 10 of these, that's my, my night it. nurse, you know, that's yeah. 30 hours of my life, but I'm getting like hundreds of hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. So I do these calculations in my head and it's not so formal, but I do, that's how I can make decisions on my feet sometimes because I'm like, yeah. oh, well this is this, this, this is that, you know, I can do this and I can make up for it. And as long as you come out on top, I think that's that's a fine way to do it. So, so the yeah. one thing I want to know, Farnoosh, is like between when you were scrappy Farnoosh to like besties with Oprah Farnoosh. Uh, <laughs> the, the, that's right. She's besties with Oprah. Um, I'm not. <laughs> but, but in between that time period, there were like a million pitfalls and opportunities for you to slip into like ridiculous debt and like yeah. screw all of it up. And it's probably much easier to screw it up than not screw it up. What did you, I mean, like people say like pay yourself first and blah, blah, blah and all these like cliche things. But what was your mindset or how did you do it so that you were able to yeah. get the things that made you feel special and, and like worth the work you're putting in, but still grow and become the far new shift today? Well, I think when you take care of the boring stuff first, then you won't neglect yourself of the nicer things. What, like I work with the money that I work with, that I spend, that I buy nice things with, I know that I've taken care of the boring stuff already. So whatever is left, I can spend. So I, when I was scrappy Farnoosh, I remember getting my first book deal and it was like a hundred thousand dollars. And what? Like I'm 26 years old. I don't even make that in my salary. That's and ridiculous. I got this book deal. I have $30,000 in student loans. I paid it all off hmm. with that money. And the rest I like, and then I did like, I contributed to my retirement account and then I put it in savings. And I think I might've paid an extra mortgage payment or two with it. So like I wanted you mean to, when you say the boring things, the like, boring hmm. things. Yeah. Like the saving and the investing and the paying off the debt, like it's all important things, but it's not like you don't get a, I mean, some get people excited. get a high off of yeah. it. You don't get like excited. You're not, it's not like a rush, but yeah. I mean, I don't know, maybe there is for some people. I definitely felt good after I paid off those student loans, but did I really have to? I mean, the interest rate was like 2%, you know, mm. the, the mm. monthly payment was like $110. It wasn't really, uh, burning a hole in my wallet, but it felt really good and responsible mm. and adults. Yeah like of me. I and so when I did it, yeah. And then, and then when you have these like urges to go spend on something frivolous, quote unquote frivolous, um, you'll do it. Cause you're like, well, I did all the right stuff. So now I'm going to do some other stuff that will just, you know, 
that I deserve because I've done all these other things right, you know, and I want to now yeah. enjoy my money. And what is money if we can't enjoy it? I agree. Yeah. I've started booking the, um, what is it? The, the Delta comfort plus seats on when I have to fly for business. Cause I used to be like, this is a business trip. I need to scrimp and save on every travel expense so I can get the most money out of what they're paying me. And then I'm like, wow, I travel like once a month. So that's a significant life experience there. And if I'm just like sitting in coach hate, like being this six foot three guy with no leg room and having to gate check my bag and all this stuff, like what am I making money for if I'm not improving my life experience in some way? I'm five, five. I have plenty of space in coach. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. <laughs> so Farnoosh, um, one, like one thing that, that I get out of hearing you talk about this is that you don't have like some hard and fast rule. Like I must save 10% or blah, blah, blah. You have more fluid, uh, like th feelings in your head about this. How do you like, like what, I guess I'm a very thresholdy kind of guy. Like I must say blah percent. Can you maybe describe how it works for you? Like how sure. you know that you're being responsible? Yes. I am very thresholdy with my retirement accounts, my college savings accounts, my brokerage accounts. So I've already done the numbers. I used to work with a financial planner. She ran the numbers for me and said, you know, if you do this amount every month, you will have this amount in retirement, theoretically, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. unless like the world ends and, you know, history doesn't repeat. But yeah. given the average historical returns and what you're investing in, this is basically what you'll have. And I so I've been I don't work with her anymore, but I've been continuing that strategy. So for mm -hmm. our SEP, my SEP IRA, I max that out. That's 52, 53,000 a year, depending okay. on, I think this year is 52. That's great. Yeah. I mean, and then I also have a brokerage account, which I contribute every month automatically $500 to it. I'm thinking about increasing it to a thousand maybe because I read a rule of thumb the other day that you should have twice your income in retirement by the time you're 40. Mm. Twice <laughs> your, so like if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you should have 200,000 in retirement by the time you're 40 is what you're saying? Yeah. Two to three. So 300 would be great. 200 okay. is good. So, um, my income fluctuates every year. So I don't, sometimes I feel like I'm doing well. Sometimes I'm like, Oh, I got to catch up. Yeah. So my goal is to have a million in retirement by 40. Cause okay. I just want to, I just want to, I want to. <laughs> One question I have specifically yeah. for you, you're an entrepreneur and it seems like your income just is, is probably rising at a pretty good rate every year. And because of what you do, unless you deliberately choose to not work when you're retired, like your income may be higher when you get to that age than it is now. So this is something I thought about and I had to deal with um, a while ago. It's like, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't anticipate stopping working. So isn't it smarter for me to not put my money in retirement accounts where once it comes out, it might be at a higher tax rate? True. Well, I mean, there's the Roth, you know, which That's is true, but yeah. then you won't qualify for that if you're making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, you could do a brokerage account, which, you know, is there's the um, capital gains tax, which is less typically than income tax, I yeah. believe. So, you know, there's ways to, di to diversify your tax exposure, mm -hmm. but the good news is you're making more. So you yeah, should pay you are, more it's, taxes. It's not a big deal. No, I mean, you know, it's like, that's how I think about it. It's like, I should pay my tax responsibility. You know, if I'm mm -hmm. making more then I should be giving back more. So I don't think of it like, I don't get too stressed out about that. Yeah. Um, and by the, brokerage, the money will mean, be there. By brokerage, you just mean like any taxable, like right. ETF index fund, anything yeah. like that. Okay. I might be wrong about that, but I feel like capital gains tax is like, Capital gains is 15%, 15 I believe, right, Andrew? Right. So, I mean, if, if you're effective or, you know, say you're making $200,000 a year, well, if you're also taking money out of a retirement account, that is effectively going to be taxed at 38 is the top, maybe, federal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, 39. Yeah, yeah, 39. So definitely is going to be less at capital gains if you're already making enough and then you're pulling out from retirement. Um, but, I mean, if there's also the the question of like, if you're making that much money when you're that age, would you even pull out of your retirement at all? Or would you just like put it into a trust for your kids or give True. it all There's away or to, something? 
there's other kinds of ways to plan your retirement other than mm-hmm. just putting them in retirement vehicles, savings vehicles. You could put it in real estate. You could put it in, like you said, a trust. You yeah. could gift it to your children. You you know, there's other things you can do with your estate so that you can sh- be less exposed to taxes mm-hmm. um, and also maybe diversify your the risk, you know, yeah. your risk exposure. Mm-hmm. So, so if I had a lot of money right now, a lot more money, I would probably buy some more real estate, you know, because it's something that I like to do. I have a, yeah. I have a pension for it. Um, I have a risk tolerance for it. I also live in New York and I've been studying the market here for 15 years. I read the New York Times real estate section first thing every <laughs> weekend. I love okay. it page to page. And so I'm always on the hunt for like another, you know, maybe good opportunity, but you need a lot of cash to do it. Right. But anyway, I just, I, I had Tim Ferriss on my podcast and he said like, I don't really like investing in the stock market as much as I do investing in companies. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's just where my risk tolerance is. Like I don't, you know. And where the interest is, because if you're not interested, you're probably not going to do that good. No, he's like, I can't deal with the fluctuations of the market every day. You got to see up, down, negative, sideways. But, you know, with a company, it's probably riskier, but he enjoys the process more. He he likes getting to know the founders. He feels like he has more of a stake Mm -hmm. and could potentially guide them and lead down, lead them to success or whatever. So everyone's different. So well, I think like for you, Andrew, a lot of your investment is into your own company and the same for me. Like I purposely take a sort of smaller salary and leave a lot in the business account so I can grow the company. So like it's, I would say that's that the investment on a, on an average month, we probably put a third of what we take in back into the company and just, uh, we, we think the returns are greater or, or so remains to be seen. You know, I guess it's a constant give and take. Uh, but Farnoosh, you were talking about earning more before and, you know, specifically you're talking about how you'd go and you'd spend three hours doing a video and they'd pay you 900, but that's based on like the Farnoosh of today where they're like, well, an hour of Farnoosh's time is $300 because of, you know, the views she garners and her expertise and blah, blah, blah. And so it's easier in a sense to, you know, earn more because you're worth more, uh, that bit aside, like, do you have any insights on just earning more? Because I'm sure the majority of your career, you were not, you know, far noosh, someone that people knew. You were just trying to earn more. Yes. And become somebody. Yes. And I think that you do become more of who you want to be through bad side gigs and just experimenting with a lot of different ways to make extra money. You get to realize like what you like doing, what you don't like doing, your work ethic, you know, your negotiating skills, your self-worth. So when I was in my early twenties, I was making very little as a new kind of budding journalist in New York city. I was a Supreme fact checker at Money Magazine. I had been promoted <laughs> I from about that. I was promoted from intern to basically like senior intern, which basically means you fact check things and sometimes you get a byline because you write and do a lot of reporting. Mm-hmm. Job paid eighteen dollars an hour. That was before taxes. I was living with a married couple in a rent st- stabilized apartment. I had my own room. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. And my own bathroom. So I was like living it up. I was like, I'm living in a doorman building on the Upper West Side. I got my own place. I got my own zip code in New York City. And my rent was $500 a month, which was amazing. Mm Because like even back for back then, it was unheard of. But I was still needing to eat. (laughs) (laughs) And so I babysat. I pet sat. I had some professors at Columbia that had cats and birds. And I became like the go-to graduate student that would just like watch your pet or your kid. So I did that. And eventually what I did to make even more money in a more meaningful way, like writing and freelance writing was I just started to let people know, um, Farnoosh needs to make more money and I want to be more out there and I want to be just utilizing more of my skill set. You know, I don't want to just be like, 
fact checking. I want to be writing more. And if I can't do it at the place that's employing me, maybe I could do it for some other place. Like there were people at my, at money magazine who freelance for the New York times. And I wasn't ready for the times yet, but I did make a connection with the guy who ran a local free paper in New York called AM New York. Mm -hmm. And yeah, which is still around. God bless them. They do great reporting, some cute stories about, all sorts of things happening in New York City, and I became their personal finance columnist. Now, that freelance gig paid me like, I don't know, 100 or $200 a post. One post became two posts per week. I was working a ton reporting on this stuff, but it really, for me, I was like doing what I loved and making money, and it helped to supplement my savings, my expenses. So it wasn't and glamorous in the beginning. Like you it was basically not were working every waking hour, yeah. like literally watching birds while writing column articles for AM New York. And another thing that I was doing was I was learning constantly. I was insistent upon learning as much as I could about the industry so that when that next opportunity came along, I had a lot to offer and I could negotiate a much higher salary for that next big paycheck. So when I was at New York One News, which was my next job after money, and even when I was at money as the intern, hmm. there was this one day when um, the publicity manager was walking around the newsroom and she was like, we need someone to go on CNN to talk about the latest issue. And nobody wanted to go. So I did. And they sent me, huh. and in the cab, I read the press release, I read the cover, <laughs> I was like, okay, I need to like figure out what I'm gonna say. Mm -hmm. Went live on CNN at the age of 21 or 22, and that was the beginning of me being comfortable on camera mm. and talking in sound bites, and that became part of a reel that later helped me you know, land bigger projects and jobs and opportunities. And mm -hmm. so always be thinking about how can I enhance my skill set? How can I take on some low cost risks? Like I wasn't going to bomb on CNN. I was mm -hmm. maybe going to say, um, too many times, but who cares? Right. Yeah. I was going to be live on TV and that I knew was going to have value for mm -hmm. me. So that helped me get another job at New York one. I was able to tell the hiring manager, it was a job for producer, but I was like, look, I, I can do on camera stuff. I'm a writer. I'm a fact checker. I, you know, and I know money. So, and the job was to be a business producer. So I got the job. People didn't believe I got the job at 25. I literally, my first day there, I was in the bathroom washing my hands and a woman was like, Oh, are you the new intern? Oh no. Farnoosh. Are you there? <laughs> Hear me? Yes. Okay. There you go. Continue bathroom. Okay. And I was washing my hands and this woman was like, oh, welcome to, welcome. Are you the new intern? And I said, no, I'm actually the new business producer. She was like, oh, <laughs> I, I, don't think, I don't even think she was, I think she was like an associate producer and she was <laughs> older. I definitely faked it till I made it. Yeah, I was definitely, yeah. I went in for that interview with a PowerPoint presentation though. Oh, wow. So you were super prepared. I was super, I'd watched the network. I was like, you need to do this. This works. This isn't working. Yeah. Um, I also didn't pick up my phone during the interview, which I learned later that somebody who was competing for the job did. Oh my God. What? Cause they're so important. They need to take people the call are now. Dumb. Yeah. That's like, pretty dumb. People like people can't do the basics. Like don't pick up your phone during an interview unless oh, yeah. you, sh you shouldn't even be on, you know, mm -hmm. like what's 20 minutes of your life. Not Interviews checking are your like phone. dating. You have to make the other person yeah. feel special. Yes. So that, so that does remind me of something I've, I remember when I was in school, I always had this like worry that like I didn't match up to the competition. Like I was always worried about that. And I've kind of learned like if you have that worry, you're probably already ahead of the pack mm. because people will pick up their phones in interviews <laughs> yeah. and just do boneheaded stuff like that. So dumb. And people who were probably more qualified than I was, but did dumb stuff during the interview yeah. and didn't mm -hmm. come prepared and were very felt entitled based on their experience. And maybe because I didn't have all the, I didn't hit all the criteria on the job description, which by the way, women are really bad at not applying for jobs because they don't hit all the bullet points, like all the requirements. Oh, yeah. They're like, Men I'm not like, qualified. It, Whereas like yeah. I talked to Laura, I apply for things that like I'm clearly unqualified for Yeah. because like what, why not? I don't know. Well, I just felt like if I got in the interview room, mm. I could convince them of you Hopefully, convince them. Yeah. yeah. And it was, it was, I was sweating, you know, like I, the woman was sort of, 
not, sh- I wasn't hitting all the notes. She's like, well, do you have experience writing for television? No, but I do have experience writing for a magazine. I went to journalism school. I took nightly news and journalism and, you know, uh, please hire me. Plus <laughs> look at my beautiful PowerPoint presentation, you know? And I, to this day, I'm still be- like really good friends with the woman who hired me. And she tells me like, you came and blew me away in that interview. And you had a presentation, you knew the show, you um, just were so eager. I knew that you were going to do well. Like you were going to have to learn some things, but you were a quick learner and you were, you like, you wanted this job more than anybody. I didn't know. I was hungry. And when I was there, New York one is not a union operation. So in other words, because it's not a union operation, anyone who works there can freely do other people's jobs. You know, like I could pick up a camera and shoot my own content. I could edit my own content. I could, there wasn't, you know, cause with unions, like you have strict people, it's strictly like the, the camera people, no one can, no one else can touch the cameras, you right. know? Really? It's, yeah. I didn't know that. And they must, you know, make overtime and they must get a lunch break and, you know, mm-hmm. so that, and that's good. But for whatever reason, New York one, because I think they don't want to invest in that. They, so, but it worked out for me because I would take out a camera on the weekend, learn how to shoot, Mm-hmm. I would edit my own pieces. So I became a very much like a one, one stop shop for mm-hmm. producing television, which then helped me get my next job at the street.com. And I was able to double my salary going there because I was like, you're hiring me. You don't have to hire four people. Yeah. You, I do it all. And they were, you know, they weren't a scrappy startup anymore, but the the video department was like this new thing that they wanted to Mm -hmm. blow up and they weren't sure how much to invest. And I was relatively cheap at that point for them to hire. So I guess the lesson we can pull out of this is if you, if you're able to take on additional jobs or additional projects at your, at your work that are maybe a little bit outside your skill set, that's a great way to increase your income in your next job because boom, new skill set on your resume you didn't have, didn't plan to have. And now you can offer that as additional benefits. Right. Awesome. Well, for you know, we've been talking for over an hour here. Is there anything else that I did want really to say one more say? thing, if okay. I may really yeah. quick. Yeah. So back to habits, processes, systems with, you know, budgeting and saving. One thing that I forgot to mention that I do do almost like, I guess every six months is I do kind of a, an audit of my expenses. So I okay. think a lot of us fall into this, habit of paying for things that we don't really need anymore mm. that you may need it. You may, you, yes. su- you subscribe to something, right? Because at the time it really fits your lifestyle. It's a need, mm-hmm. but then you don't really need it anymore. And, but you keep paying for the service. Mm-hmm. So, or you don't really want it anymore, but it's like $10 a month. And maybe you forgot that you're paying for it. You know, it's like when you go to the airport and you buy the $10 worth of whatever Wi-Fi hot, like bingo or whatever, boingo. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And they want you to subscribe to it. Not to but you can't just like, you can get like the one time, but then it's, I don't know. So that happened to me once I was like, what the heck I'm for the last seven months I've been paying for effing boingo. And, <laughs> and so I called boingo and I was like, can you just stop charging me? And they're like, yeah, we really apologize. They actually took off the last like four months of charging me. That's actually really oh, cool. good. Isn't that okay. nice? Yeah, that is nice. And by the way, if you have an Amex, I think any Amex, they have a relationship now with a lot of these internet Wi-Fi providers. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you, if you just put in your, if you say you're a Wi-Fi or sorry, if you say you're an Amex member, they will, you might get it for free. So oh, now I, oh, I get cool. it for free. I have noticed that a lot of airports are moving to free Wi-Fi anyway. Yeah. Like I, this actually, was a while I can't ago. think of an airport I've been in in a while that actually charges for Wi-Fi, which is really nice. I think they yeah. just realized like most people are just going to tether off their phones if they have to pay. So. You can use your phone as a hotspot now. So yeah. Like, yeah. what it is, yeah, this was years ago. So I'm sure this would, the story would not be re- relevant or, um, it would be happening, mm. but that's one thing, but look at your bills every six months just to understand what am I paying for again? So much of it is automated. So much of it is you subscribe and you forget. Mm. Yeah. Do I really need it. I had a guest on my podcast tell me that every year they go to sort of ground zero with their budget and they start, they start over. They basically tear everything out of the budget 
And they go, really? based on our life today and where we're headed in the next six months or a year, what do we really need? We still mm-hmm. need to pay our bills, mortgage, car, you know, but like all these lifestyle things that we're paying for, do we really need it? And like one of the things that I came to, I reconciled with was cable. I was like, I don't need this. Yeah. So now I don't have cable. That's a brilliant idea. I think that Laura mm-hmm. and I need to do that because we probably have made some decisions that just aren't relevant to us anymore you know we just need to kind of like re yeah i i like the budget yeah. from scratch thing you know or what if you're like paying for a gym and it's just automated and then like you start a sport so now you're paying for going to the sport club and it's like well the does right. do you need the gym now or can you get all your exercise at that sport exactly so all kinds Good of example. stuff one thing I like to do in addition to auditing my expenses is every three months I go through and just like calculate what my net worth is. So I like add up all my accounts, including retirement, including brokerage accounts, and then look at my debt and just get a number. So kind of my my little like North Star is, is that going up? And then at the end of the month, you're like, ah, I'm still awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and well, if it's not, then it means, okay, I've got a spending problem or... I'm not making enough or something like that. So earning problem. Yeah. Yeah. Or there's an earning problem. And I mean, I've always been one of those kind of people who like, if I, if I want to buy something, my first thought is, okay, how do I go make more money? Not, well, I have to wait for that. Or how do I get it cheaper? It's always like, could I find an extra client or could I hound Andrew to sell more ads or something? So <laughs> Andrew is already I think trying to sell more me. ads, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think it, it all just comes down to like, how do you think about money and then figuring out habits that work best with that style? Yes. So and the earlier our- you start these habits, I think by the time you get to my age, I'm older than you guys, you it becomes second nature. Like I made the analogy earlier, like with your diet, you know, you maybe start in your twenties, I was like all over the place. I was like, I'm not going to eat bread. I'm only going to not eating dairy anymore. I'm only going to eat carrots. And I'm like, you, and then like none of it works. Yeah. Um, and I finally met this nutritionist. She was like in the, at the end of the day, a lot of us just eat like five things, you know, it's recurring. <laughs> yep. And so you got to look at those five things. Are you happy with those five things? Are those mm-hmm. five things actually fuel and good? And my things were like yogurt, carrots, cereal, pizza and bagels, you know? And I was like, I have no meat and protein in this or at least nothing. We have the same diet, (laughs) Farnoosh. So so that's a good, maybe an analogy for your money. Like what are the five things you're spending most of your money on? Are you happy with these five things? Mm -hmm. Sort of like your friend circle. You have five friends, you really like them? Mm. You know, and start there. It's maybe (laughs) an easy way to kind of take, sort of attack your financial life, but, you know, starting with those five basics and then adjusting them, taking, you know, swapping things out or modifying Mm -hmm. so that those, because at the end of the day, those five things are probably what's taking the biggest bite out of your money and your budget. Yeah. So paying attention to that is, is, is key. So automate, but have times when you scrutinize the automations. Yeah, for sure. It's been awesome talking with you. I know you have your own podcast as well with 593 episodes so far it looks like yeah we're close to 5 million downloads so we're uh it's it's awesome i'm really i can't believe it it's been you guys have been podcasting longer than i have i feel but you know it it just every day it's it feels like a new adventure um yeah curious to see where we'll be this time next year but it's uh it's a lot of fun Hopefully, yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. So, guys, Farnoosh's podcast is called So Money, and we'll have it linked up in the show notes. So, if you want more personal finance than we can give you, uh, she's got 593 episodes and <laughs> counting that you can go dig into. Um, and you've also got your three books. You've got Farnoosh.tv, your website. Uh, like you said, you contribute to Oprah. Like, there's a zillion things. Anything else? Um, Well, something I'm really excited about right now is I've started a workshop that I do once or twice a year. The next one's in October and has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with how to write a book and then leverage the book to become your own personal brand. So it's basically my life (laughs) in a workshop and everything I've learned from my career and 
bringing it to you in, in two days, all the people that have helped me and all the practices. And, uh, it's been now, this is my second year. I don't know when this is airing, but, um, the next workshop is in October. If you're interested, um, uh, you can apply, go to, uh, book to brand dot farnoosh dot tv book to brand dot farnoosh dot tv the number two or the t o book t t o thank you it's Mm. book to brand dot farnoosh dot tv um i'm working on a better url at the moment but that's where the application is and it's very small it's just eight people that i'm taking and i'm um close to filling up the workshop so if you hear this and you are like pick me. Um, let me know that you listened to this episode and, uh, we'll hopefully get you in. How awesome. long does it take you to make a book varnish? How, or how long should it take someone to make a book? Well, if you're going to, yeah, you know, lunch hour, <laughs> if you work with a traditional publisher, mm. you're, you're on their schedule. Yeah. And from selling your book proposal to actually seeing your book in on Amazon and in, in stores, It's about a year and a half, two years sometimes, Mm -hmm. depending on the schedule of other books that are coming out. Plant the seed and just push it along while you do other. Right, but I'd like to think that the workshop really shortcuts a lot of it for you, in the in the sense of we don't just just teach you how to write a book and sell it, but we also teach you how to market it Mm -hmm. and how to connect with the right people to help you get that book. And I think those are the hardest parts. Yeah. Yeah, the people, like you know. I've met these people over the course of 15 years. I'm bringing them all to you in two days. That's worth something. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely check that well, out. I'll you, Andrew and Thomas at the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, we'll have so to I'm going and I, I need some contacts. <laughs> I, do, I do have somebody who keeps telling you. me to write a book. So I do. when I do decide to do that, uh, I guess my second book, I want it to be as successful as possible. And you might be the person to talk to to make sure that happens. Book to brand dot farnoosh dot TV. <laughs> I'll give you a special right. discount. Sweet. So yeah, we'll have that link in the show notes. So guys, definitely check that out. Also, um, we have rebranded, relaunched, and retightened our real estate. What is it? Real estate property evaluation tool. That's mm-hmm. the word for it. So now it is at simplewealth.co. And Andrew just coded up this really sweet looking homepage for it. So check that out if you're interested in the real estate investing stuff we've talked about in this episode. You can also find our favorite resources at listenmoneymatters.com slash toolbox. And hey, if you guys like this podcast, go give us a review and rating on iTunes. And while you're at it, subscribe to Farnish's podcast as well and give her a rating and review as well. Definitely helps support the show. Thank you. <laughs> Andrew's saying I love you <laughs> silently. <laughs> so guys, thank you so much for listening and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Later. Later, man. Please tell your friends about this show.